Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome everyone and welcome to our celebration of International Women's Day. I've got my mug right here already and Women's History Month. I'm Nina Easton. I'm Senior Associate here at CSIS and I'm also the moderator of the Smart Women, Smart Power live event series. I'm also co-CEO of Sellers Easton Media where we give voice to leaders who are making an impact. Today, Beverly Kirk, who directs the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative, will be swapping places with me. She's actually good friends with our speaker. They've been planning this event for quite some time, and it is going to be truly extraordinary. And speaking of Bev, um, Bev moderates our uh, Smart Women, Smart, excuse me, Smart Women, Smart Power podcast. Um, please follow that, and especially this month, because there's a special series we're doing. We're joining up with Girl Security, which is an organization that empowers girls in national security. And this is a special series this month. It uh, will show every Wednesday. And what it does is matches uh, girl scholars with women that they really admire who are established leaders. So that's going to be really something extraordinary to watch. And I'm really going to enjoy having Bev moderate each one of those. So today, we're very pleased to welcome Gail Simak Lamon. She's going to be talking about her newest book. She is, of course, a bestseller. Um, and her current book is The Daughters of Kobani. It's the incredible story of the Kurdish women who fought and defeated ISIS in Northeast Syria. The Smart Women, Smart Power Speaker Series is possible thanks to our founding partner, City. We're so grateful for City's support. Um, they've been there from the beginning and we really rely on them. Thank you, City. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Kristen Solheim. She's Director of Federal Government Affairs at City, and she will take it from here. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Nina. It's great to be here. And thank you for everyone to, for joining us this afternoon for a special edition on International Women's Day. Um, City's been sponsoring this event for the last six years, and it's such an honor to bring together leaders in national security, foreign policy, and the business community, and today an author on some of the world's most pressing issues. I must say that with Kamala Harris in the vice president's office, Kathleen Hicks at the DOD, and of course, Jane Frazier, the new CEO at City. this International Women's Day feels a little extra special. So on behalf of City and our more than 100,000 women in our global workforce, happy International Women's Day to all of you. We um, proudly call ourselves the leading global bank because we, we are on the ground in more than 100 countries, which gives us not only a distinct business advantage, but a unique window into the opportunities and challenges facing people all around the world. Today, we're thrilled to have another smart and powerful woman in our midst who's going to talk about her fascinating new book. And I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing from her as much as me. So I'll pass it over to Bev to get us started. Thank you. Kristen, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And thanks to City for being our founding partner and continuing to support us all these years. Well, our guest today is Gail Simak Limon, and she has written three New York Times bestselling books The Dressmaker of Care Kana in 2011, Ashley's War in 2015, and now The Daughters of Kobani, which released on February 16th and became a New York Times bestselling book in just about two weeks of its publication. 
Hidden Light Productions, whose founders include Hillary and Chelsea Clinton, bought the rights to the, the Daughters of Kobani to turn this book into a TV series. And as you may know already, Ashley's War is being made into a movie by some of Hollywood's biggest names, including Oscar-winning actress Reese Witherspoon, Homeland director Leslie Linka Glatter, and Gone Girl producer Bruna Papandrea. Gail is also an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. And Gail, we are honored to have you here today for our celebration of International Women's Day. Congratulations on the book. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm really delighted to be with you. I think the work you do is so important at Smart Women, Smart Power. And you know, I'm really thrilled to be here. Well, for those who may have not yet read the book, can you give a basic summary of the story? The book really is about the all women's force that fought really starting in 2013 and 2014 to hand the Islamic State its first defeat. So this is a story really about a group of women who originally took up arms to take care of their neighborhoods, to protect their towns, like so many of the women watching today, right? You see uh, uncertainty coming and you organize and you get together, what's gonna happen next? And then the Syrian civil war metastasized into a fight that became uh, about extremism years into the conflict. And in 2014, at a moment when no one had beaten the Islamic State, there came this David versus Goliath story in this town of Kobani that very few people outside the region had ever heard of. And this fighting force that was standing up to ISIS. And in the middle of this fighting force was a group of women who absolutely stood not just to fight against ISIS, but to fight for women's equality and emancipation. And I uh, really wanted this book to just take readers into that world of who were these women? How did the United States end up coming to see these people as their partner on the ground in the fight against ISIS? And what did it look like for the world to see a whole different breed of folks, a whole different group of people standing up to the men who bought and sold women? every single day and town by town uh, for a half decade. How did you learn about these Kurdish women fighters? I mean, you're a recovering journalist like me. <laughs> so if, right. if I never call us former journalists because I don't think you ever are a former, you're just recovering from it. Um, but you, did somebody just call you up and say, hey, have I got a story for you? You know, uh, I've had the privilege of writing at that point, two books that had to do with uh, the role of women in war. I never set out to write about women. I set out to tell stories that weren't being told, that took us into worlds we didn't know and had consequences we didn't yet understand. And uh, in 20, early 2016, I got a WhatsApp call from Syria and one of the women soldiers from Florida, Cassie, for those of you who had read uh, Ashley's War, called me and said, you have to come to Syria. She said, you know, I'm here, I'm deployed and there are women in the partner force fighting ISIS on the front lines. And she said, and the thing is, not only are they leading women in battle, but they're also leading men. And she said, and Gail, you know, they have the full respect both of the men that they're fighting alongside in battle and the United States Special Operations Forces, right? Folks who've done 12, 13, 14 deployments at that time in uh, the post 9-11 conflicts. And she said, you know, you just have to see it because it's, it is, she said, it's so unbelievable because not only are they fighting against ISIS, they're fighting for emancipation. And at that moment, I thought, you know, who, who wouldn't want to tell that story? And was I the right person to do it? And you have a special connection to this part of the world. Uh, by that, I mean, Iraq, your dad was born in Baghdad and he spent his early years there before the family was expelled from the country for religious reasons. And you write about on your travels to Northeast Syria, carrying his Iraqi passport as you researched this book. Why did you feel it was important to do that? It's interesting. I mean, you know, I think this is the most personal book I've written, although it is definitely not about me. And I am certainly uh, the first person to say that I think anybody could have written this book who cared deeply about this, but there was no question that I had a sliver of a fraction of an inkling uh, 
as to the journey these women would have made. As you'll see in the in the prologue to the Daughters of Kobani, uh, my father, God rest his soul, you know, we used to have endless debates about women's equality. Uh, and my father would really engage with me because at the beginning he thought it was bananas. But then by the end, I think by the time I was 10 or 11 or 12, we would have really long conversations. And, and I recount in the prologue that there was a moment in which he turned to me once and said, do you really think men and women are equal? Because in the world he came from, this was not a disrespectful statement. It was really expressing um, incredulity. You know, my father was uh, born in Baghdad. His father was from Kirkuk. His mother was from Baghdad. And he had grown up in a totally different universe. And so we used to sometimes joke that it was divine justice that he had the ultimate, you know, <laughs> uh, child who was bound and determined to expose him to different worldviews by the time I was eight or nine. But I, I really did feel connected to him and, and to the region. And if you look at the dedication, uh, it was for those of you a family in the region, you'll realize immediately which one was for my father. And speaking of the region, you are a native to this area. Your dad ended up in Greenbelt, Maryland. And for the non-DC watchers here, that's a suburb of Washington, DC and Prince George's County, Maryland. And you also write about the lessons that you learned from your dad living, uh, living in this area. And did those lessons impact uh, the way you approach the book and inspire your interest in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan? It's interesting. I mean, I don't think explicitly, right? But my father and I would always watch the news together. My mother and I would always watch the news together. They divorced when I was five, but we had a family that was very much into always um, debating what was the issue? How did the Americans approach it? How did the Middle East view? I mean, what was my father's view of it? What was my mother's view of it? And my mother believed deeply in watching C-SPAN the moment C-SPAN came into existence, watching Sunday morning, pushing me always. Um, I grew up in a community of single moms, really, where uh, nobody had a college education or college degree, let alone an advanced degree. And I think it was that community of women growing up in that spirit of community of women from all backgrounds in PG County, which is a place that, you know, is uh, only 11 miles, but 12 worlds removed from official Washington that really shaped, uh, I think, uh, such a huge blessing of being able to see stories as an outsider. Right to not need other people to think a story was important because I hadn't come from a place that people thought was important or a family that people thought was important or a community. And I think it gave me such an appreciation for communities of women underestimated from the outside who rose to the moment in service to a cause greater than themselves. And it made me passionate about helping people to see the universality of those stories. And let's delve into the women that you write about. How did their families respond to what they wanted to do? This area of Northeastern Syria um, basically was a no man's land once the Syrian civil war started. The Assad government basically left the locals to rule themselves. And the locals actually set up laws uh, that said basically men and women are, are equal under the law here. Yes, this is a group of Syrian Kurds, and we really go into this world of Mazima and Nowruz and Rojda and Znarin, right, and, and meet people who stood up at the beginning just to take care of their communities, to keep outsiders out, and to put in place for the first time Kurdish self-rule. And that was a form of self-governance that had women right at the center. So there was a male and female head of every town. There were women's councils in every town. And the whole notion of women's equality was embedded into their founding documents, right? This document that really was recognized by nobody outside its borders, but that had women mentioned 13 times. A yes to girls' education, no to dowry, no to child marriage, um, yes to women's economic equality. And I was really fascinated by who these people were and how had this come to be that on the ashes of the fight against the Islamic State, you had truly one of the most far reaching experiments in women's equality that we've seen uh, any place in the world brought to you by women who had fought ISIS literally, literally like house by house and room by room. And to your question, just, just one story about as Nareen, who's uh, already readers have been writing me about her. You know, here's a young woman who is about to go to a university, wants to go to university and her father comes and says, look, I'm sorry, your uncle doesn't think that this is what girls in our family need to do. So those dreams are squashed. She meets somebody a couple of years later who she loves, who she wants to marry. And her father again comes and says, listen, your uncle has chosen someone for you. Uh, you can't marry the person you love. And she says, no. 
I'm not going to marry anybody then. And then a couple of years later, when folks knock on their door that are you know, really with this kind of brand of political uh, action in favor of women's equality, um, she immediately responds. And we follow her all the way from being the driver and kind of a gopher for Nauruz, who's the head of the women's protection units in the ISIS fight, all the way to helping to liberate her hometown from the Islamic State. And girls coming up to her and seeing her as a role model. And it's that journey that I think is such the universal quest for human dignity. It has nothing to do with any geography or any ethnic group or any one gender, right? Um, that I think we all can relate to, especially in this moment when we're talking about women rewriting the rules that govern our lives that we didn't make. Mm -hmm. And there's one really poignant story in the book uh, where a, a young, a really young girl sees these women fighters and comes up to the gates of the security compound where they, where they are. And, you know, they're initially really worried about someone getting through their security boundary. Um, and she just wants to know, how can I join you? Yeah. Yes. And it's a moment. I just want readers to meet these women. I want them to spend time in this community and see the complexity of this story, right? And the geopolitical complexity of the story, and then the humanity amid the inhumanity of the Islamic State. Uh, I had the privilege of spending a lot of time with girls from the Arab community. And there's one story of uh, young women from the town of Menbij who uh, I interviewed were part of this Menbij military council. And I interviewed these young women. They'd never met a foreigner, never been interviewed Beverly, right? And so they're kind of all looking down the two or three young women. And finally, I realized that, you know, these women, these young women would never have heard the notion women's equality, would they? You know, what, what, what did that sound like when they first joined? this man uh, military council. And so I asked this woman, I, just, I said, had you all ever heard the phrase women's equality? And they look up from sort of looking at the ground, not focused on me, not wanting to be my eye. They look up straight at me and start laughing. They're like, of course we had never heard of the phrase women's rights. We actually thought they were making it up the first time we heard it. And then we called our grandmothers and our cousins and said, you know, where there's this thing, women's equality and women's rights. And, and they, said, they said we were making it up. She said, but now we go back and we talk to them about it. And I think, you know, to me, that was what was so moving was to see this front line, that the fault lines among all these young women's lives and to put that in a book that people could spend time with, however they felt about it. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to quote from the book um, and get your reaction to, particularly because it is International Women's Day. Um, you write, never had I encountered women more confident about leading people, more comfortable with power and less apologetic about running things. Where did that confidence come from? And, you know, was this what made them so successful in their battle against ISIS? I mean, I really want readers to contend with that, too, because I have been thinking a lot about this. That thought came to me at the end of a day when our car had broken down, our truck had broken down, and three young women from the Women's Protection Force had actually driven us back to our hotel. And you see these three young women, with their AKs in the back, right? And where our air fresheners go, right? My father always had a vanilla air freshener hanging from the rear view mirror. They had a picture of a young woman who was one of their dear friends who had died fighting ISIS. So she was always with them wherever they went. And the three of them are going, they drive past checkpoints and we get, they take us back to our hotel. And I thought, you know, it just looks different when there's no apology involved, when it's like, we have every right to be here and to take up space. And I wanted to understand where that came from. And I think the answer is, is twofold. And I welcome your thoughts as a reader. I think one of it is the military victories. It's, it's having tested yourself in the toughest of combat. I mean, I had U.S. special operations folks spend hours with me talking about the kind of combat these women saw and led through and the enormous respect. And the book really spends time with their perspective too, uh, as, as they're meeting these women. Just you know, having tested yourself and passed the test. I think that was the first part. And the second part was also what made them such a complex partner for the United States was the fact that they followed Abdullah Ocalan, who was in prison in Turkey, right? Who had really expressly written, the Kurds cannot be free until women are free. And it talked about women's equality as a central tenet to uh, Kurdish emancipation and Kurdish self-rule. And I think those two together, having been tested and won and, and their political uh, ideology that motivated them, really made it look and feel different. And because all of you won't necessarily all go to northeastern Syria, I really wanted you to spend time in that world in the book. 
Well, since you mentioned uh, uh, Mr. Ochoan, we have to talk about the controversial part of of, uh, of this uh, situation uh, that finds itself unfolding in Northeast Syria. He, uh, as I understand it, was the founder of the PKK, right? That's yeah. the terrorist group. It, the US recognizes it as a terrorist group. The EU recognizes it as a terrorist group. The government of Turkey recognizes it as a, mm -hmm. a, as a terrorist group. So, and that caused some problems when the United States wanted to work with the Kurdish fighters to defeat ISIS back in 2014-2015. Uh, um, so what did you see on the ground? Were these women, did they subscribe to the, the terrorist activities that Ocalan uh, uh, is known for in Turkey? How did that work? If so I think some light on that. It's such a complex conversation and the book really spends a lot of time walking you through the policy tightrope that the US officials were walking. The United States makes a distinction between uh, the Syrian Kurds who had partnered with, it chose to partner with in 2014, starting in Kobani from the ground, Azima, Rojda, Nauruz, and, and, and the people who uh, it felt had the unique ability to both take terrain and keep terrain from the Islamic State and the will to fight room by room and house by house against ISIS as America's partner force on the ground. And you, the United States early on made a distinction between uh, the Syrian Kurds who were part of the People's Protection Units and then the Women's Protection Units that formed as part of that and the PKK from which of which they were an offshoot. And the book goes into really, I think pretty extensive detail about both the policy debate inside in Washington, right? With some in the State Department saying you can't work with this group of Syrian Kurds and others saying from both the military and diplomatic side saying very clearly and very publicly, not only can we, but this is our best shot at fighting the terrorists of the Islamic State. And at the end of the book, I think there's a beautiful memo written by Ambassador Roebuck that really goes into the, the continuation of this policy tightrope because uh, Turkey and this group of Syrian Kurds were, and uh, Ocalan were actually, there were lots of dialogue and diplomatic overtures going on up until uh, you know, 2014, 2015. And I think that is where the United States in many ways would like to get back to. But you know, that is the complexity from the policy landscape that the United States from the military and diplomatic side was facing. It, it seems to me like it's a classic case of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And, well, and I mean, in this case, you had look, the ghost of the Iraq war hung over every decision made on Syria. The Obama administration felt very deeply it had been elected to end wars in the Middle East, certainly not to engage in new ones. And it was looking for a partner force that was willing to fight ISIS to the very last breath, but not bent on regime change. And the book goes into that, right, that policy conversation, which I know some of you on this call have lived. And because the Obama administration had no appetite for regime change that was brought about by anybody uh, outside Syria's borders. And, and so you see this, like who is going to fight ISIS? You've got to remember 2014, the United States was deeply worried about the threat to the United States and to Europe that ISIS posed. And then here we have this moment in 2014 in Kobani where the world's imagination is seized because onto CNN, onto the global stage is this fighting force with women at the core, with women's emancipation right at the heart that is bringing it, bringing the fight to ISIS and really standing up to the Islamic State at a time when it had not ever experienced one battlefield defeat. And that's the moment when we join in the book, US policymakers saying, okay, do we, do we support these folks? Because if they're wiped out, what are we going to do, right? What is our next best policy option? And that is what the world I want readers to enter. Because had they not been there very feasibly, the conversation would have had to turn to, are we going to send US troops, more US troops? The debate that. would have looked very different. And also uh, the history, right? If Kobani had fallen, right. we would have had a very different, I, I think, campaign to stop the Islamic State. And that chapter where you write about the battle for Kobani is, it's so intense. I read this book in one afternoon, and <laughs> that was one of the most intense sections of the book, just describing what was happening on the, on the battlefield. How did you get these fighters to kind of relive what they experienced because that the dialogue in the book is very real. 
Thank you. I mean, it's, it's a huge testament to all the people who trusted me with their story. I mean, this, you have to really imagine that this is a David versus Goliath showdown, right? Happening now on CNN in 2014 and happening on social media. So there is such an archive on Twitter, on Facebook, on all kinds of uh, social media platforms, on people's WhatsApp, you know, uh, on their phones, because this was all happening in real time. And David was also a woman in this story. So the, you know, the imagination was captured and people were sharing videos and trying to understand what was happening from the outside. And from the inside, people were really trying to get the word out as much as they could while fighting ISIS, right? Because no one expected uh, ISIS to be stopped in Kobani. And, and there's a moment in the book where Azima, who's, you know, one of these, uh, one of the women commanders who so many people already have written me about kind of swashbuckling, chain smoking, kind of wry sense of humor, who's a high school volleyball star who just led from the front, right? She wanted to be there. And her family would say, you have such long odds. And she said, no, we are going to stop them in Kobani. Kobani will not fall. And I wanted people to also hear the interconnectedness, right, of ISIS fighters on the radio to one another with these women hearing, we're going to come enslave you, we're going to come find you, all kinds of truly awful things. And the women who were leading the fight against ISIS working to find motivation in that, to not give in to the ugliness of that. Because I think from a human standpoint, really one of the questions I kept asking was, how did you not just pick up the radio and just trash talk back, right? Because maybe it's my PG County instinct, right? But like my instinct would definitely to be to respond. And they had just kind of worked to really be above that fray. But some of the younger people they led would get on the radio and say, oh, you're such a man, you know, show us. And they would have this kind of back and forth. And I wanted readers to feel that connectivity with the opponent. When one time one of the men, you write about how one of the men that they baited on the radio actually showed himself, which let one of the sharpshooters attack them. One of the women sharpshooters, that is attack this guy from ISIS. Uh, it, all of this makes me want to ask you about this story and the way we talk about universal stories. We don't talk about men's stories, but <laughs> if, there's a, if there's a story with more than one woman character, as you wrote for Medium, it's designated a women's story. Um, but this, as you, as you painted this picture of David versus Goliath, that's kind of universal. This whole thing, this quest for dignity, the human spirit, the refusal to give up in the face of, of really uh, very long odds, uh, the desire to rewrite the rules that shape your lives, these are all universal. And I think the intellectual infrastructure in this country has yet to include women in what it defines as serious. And I want these stories to be part of changing that. I want people to see themselves in this experience regardless, the way we always have with men. Right, it, we shouldn't be bound by whether the person looks exactly like us in terms of how we feel our own human experience being lived. And, and I, I think seeing ourselves in stories is so very important. And seeing stories that aren't uh, out, you know, in the mainstream today of how we define what is serious is so important for reshaping what we see as serious and what we see as universal going forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we're talking about this, I just want to note that uh, if you have questions, please go to the CSIS.org website where the box says, ask a question uh, on our event page, and you can certainly submit a question. And we already have a couple that have been submitted. And because we're talking about this particular point, Eileen uh, Paris from the Hawkeye Group International uh, asked this question uh, related to how you got the information from the fighters. She says, as a student about to complete a doctorate in information systems and communication, I am curious if you were embedded with the female soldiers fighting ISIS or if you conducted an ethnography living with them and learning all of their rites and rituals um, as the story is compelling and useful on so many areas, on so many levels. Thank you. It's an excellent question. Um, I did not embed a lot of that. I go the opening of the book is really going out to the front line in the fight against uh, ISIS in Raqqa, which is the so-called capital of the Islamic State, right? Where ISIS bought and sold women on, on the very streets. I spent a lot of time back reporting. So what I would do would be to spend tedious hours to the point that they would all joke with me, like, oh my God, is this book ever gonna get done? You know, how many more times are you coming to see us? Um, 
But so much of it is about taking a set of facts and asking every single person you're interviewing the same set of facts. So-and-so says this, and, and does this mean agree? Where were you standing? What did you eat? What did it smell like? What did you have for breakfast? Um, there's a detail in there about what people were eating that was matched up with five different uh, accounts, plus a several news accounts, plus some local video, right? So it's really um, the detective work of matching and marrying the information that people uh, give you and also doing it over and over and over again um, so that people feel like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you can't ask the same question one more time, can you? But that's my job is to get as close as I possibly could to what it felt like that day and, and to bring you into it. One question that I'm curious about is uh, the, the stereotype or the image that people have, um, uh, not all people, but maybe some people have of women in the Middle East. And this book smashes through just about every one, every stereotype I've ever heard of. Um, did you set out to, did you set out to do that with this book? Is no, that, I mean, you know, you know this, you, you know this, it's like, you don't set out to do anything other than shine a flashlight and illuminate a world and take people in with the flashlight, however they feel about it. It's not about my politics, my views, it's not even in there, right? Like what I want to do is take you into that world and make you feel like you've spent time with them because you've lived in that world as close as I could get it on the page to what it was for them. And then you come away and decide what you'd make of it, what you take from it. And, you know, also having family who comes from the regions, I've never understood this kind of victim narrative. In fact, I gave a TED talk in 2011 that um, you can't count what you don't see and you don't invest in things that are invisible. And because the narrative of the victim shapes so much of what we see as outsiders in the region, it gets in the way of what is actually happening on the ground. And there's a moment at the end of the book where I was at the opening of the Rockwell Women's Council, just to show you my own biases, really, you know, uh, I go to the opening of the Rockwell Women's Council, just this is in the summer of 2018, and I go in expecting kind of a, a very manufactured for foreigners kind of event. And as it turns out, my cynicism was so misplaced, right? There are very few other foreigners or no other Americans I could spot. There are one or two Europeans who, who more or less live in the region and commute uh, back and forth you know, twice a year to Europe. And I was so moved spending so many time. I interviewed like, you know, probably 20 women there. Why are you here? My mother-in-law is watching my children. They never had this chance. She wanted me to come out and be here today after we had such a hard time under ISIS. And this is about us speaking up for our community. And I wanted people to spend time with them. Were you ever afraid or worried when you were reporting this story? I mean, you write about being in places where shots were being fired all around you. I mean, anything I ever felt is nothing compared to the strength and the courage of those I have the privilege of writing about. You know, I, I think for me, I lost my mom as a child. My mom passed when I was 13. And I think it gave me such a keen sense that you must make every day count and that your work should really stand for something. For me, it was about risk mitigation. I have an amazing team I worked with, but I just, I saw this story and I thought, we have to know this, that we have to see who these people are who sacrificed so much to stop the physical caliphate of the Islamic State. And I wanted people to know uh, Azima and her hilarious exchanges with her sister who would call during the battle for Kobani just to know she was okay. And Azima would yell at her and say, I told you to stop calling me. I'm trying to fight ISIS here. You know, I'm going to call you back when this is all over, but you've got to stop driving me bananas and calling. You know, I wanted people to see that humanity, that friendship, that these were also uh, women who were sisters and daughters, not superhuman. I mean, I love Tessa Thompson, but we're not talking about like the Valkyries from Thor Ragnarok, right? Like, these are ordinary people who got put into extraordinary moments. And if I have the God-given privilege to be able to share that with you and with these amazing group of people here today, then I, I felt like I had to do it. Um, there was a line from the dressmaker of Karhana, the first book, I wrote about a teenage girl whose business supported her family under the Taliban. And her father once said to me, you do as much as you can for as many as you can for as long as you can. And I feel like if that guy did a lot of us, we might be in a better place. 
I, you're right about that. I, I see a theme in the, the three books that you've written, and it's really about how women rise up to meet near impossible challenges. And going back to what we were talking about, the universal story, that's kind of the universal story for a whole lot of women in all different parts of the world from all different kinds of backgrounds and communities. They, whenever there's a challenge, they rise up to it and, and do their best to, to develop a fix. It's right. And it's in all of our interests, right? I mean, the theme that animates so much of the work I have the, the chance to do is that suffocated opportunity is the enemy of global stability. We need everybody's talents. We need every young woman who has the dream to be a scientist, to be a teacher. We need every young person who says, you know what? I actually can do this, even if you think I can't, to be able to achieve their potential. And if I can tell stories that inspire us all to find a little bit more of what's required to challenge that status quo and find that universal human story, uh, then, then I feel, will feel like I've done a small thing. Well, we have another question uh, that has come in and it's a writer who asks about your book being adapted into a series. I mentioned that at the beginning, uh, Hidden Light Productions is gonna make this into a TV series. And uh, it says, we're seeing more television shows tell stories about the YPJ. That's the acronym describing yeah. the women's protection units. So looking at mainstream entertainment, what do you think are the absolutely crucial YPJ elements that creators need to think about carefully and represent well while telling the stories about these fighters? Oh, such an excellent question. And one, you know, we all think about, you think about writing, putting these folks on a page, right? And there was actually a beautiful letter that the YPJ wrote saying that they uh, were really a uh, excited and enthusiastic about the adaptation and would love to see some of it shot on location in Kobani, which would be a dream, right? I mean, and to the, the plan, of course, is to work with creators from the region and to make sure that the people whose story uh, I've had the privilege of telling are very much a part of this. And, and it's just, it's so moving to see them so excited. That's what means the most. Uh, but what means, I think, uh, the most to me in terms of what I'm so excited about for those who haven't been there is for them to get to spend time with, with Azima and Roja and to see, you know, Roja as a girl, you know, was playing soccer with her cousin in a village, in her grandmother's village. And her uncle actually dressed up as a ghost to keep them from playing because that's not what girls did, right? Girls weren't supposed to be playing, playing soccer and playing football, I should say, right? Uh, in, in the region. And to go on that journey from there to being the American's true interlocutor multiple times a day in the fight to take back Raqqa from ISIS, right? And, and it's really interesting because um, one of the U.S. special operations folks said to me, you know, at the beginning, I'd never worked with women in a partner for us. And then almost immediately, I saw that the warrior ethos was the same. Mm -hmm. And by the end, I really wanted my daughters to be like them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, those journeys are what I want people to go on. And let me follow up quickly on that, because it was in this particular time frame that there was a debate in this country about the roles that women in the military could actually have as it was related to combat. And I think when the story started, um, I, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but were American women in the military able to have all of the combat jobs at the time, or were they still restricted from some combat jobs? In 2014, no. And, and remember, you know, Ashley's War came out in 2015, and that was about an all-women special operations team that had been recruited for Army Ranger and Navy SEAL missions while women were officially banned from ground combat. So it came out ahead of the history. And Cassie, this U.S. soldier from Ashley's War, who called me, you know, she called me in early 16. That was um, the first time, right, January 2016, the first time that all roles across the military were open to women. So this was very living history. And in fact, there's a moment uh, in, in the book where um, actually Cassie is talking about, you know, these women um, don't have any restrictions on the roles that they're playing, in part because it's an existential fight, in part because it's of the ideology, in part because it truly is every person for themselves uh, in the fight against ISIS. And, and she said, you know, it, it does look different. And, and it's true, right? There's also a moment, Beverly, where um, an actually a special operations soldier told me and thought the story was very funny, that somebody from one of the conventional forces had come with them to a rally point uh, where there were a group of young women going off to fight ISIS. 
And this uh, U.S. service member goes up to this young man from the People's Protection Units and goes to shake their hand. And the guy says, if you're looking for the commander, she's, she's right there. And the special operations soldier who told me the story said he knew that that was what was going to happen, but he wanted this person to experience that for themselves. And, and it really is a moment uh, in the story that I think shows kind of the, the kind of upside down kind of tumbling of uh, of worldviews and expectations that becomes part of this story for the U.S. And where is that story now yeah. for the U.S.? ISIS obviously was defeated, um, and in no, uh, you know, in no large part uh, uh, thanks to the the work that these these women did. Um, but where are we now? Because the policy in Northeast Syria is still for lack of a better term, complicated yeah. by the fact that the Turkish government, unlike the U.S., does not place a distinction between the Syrian Kurds and the PKK. And there's been activity at the border there. So can you, can you speak to what's actually happening now? Sure. And in fact, the end of the book really goes into this, right? Um, the U.S. asking the Syrian Kurds to destroy some of its defensive positions as active negotiations happen, then uh, Turkey feeling like it, its uh, requirements were not met, Turkish-backed incursion launches, the U.S. Uh, does not fully withdraw, but withdraws from part of its positions, and all of this is happening in real time. Uh, the policy tightrope the United States started walking on in 2014, and now has walked across three administrations, Obama, Trump, and now Biden has not uh, severed and it is very much in place. What is fascinating now is that many of the same people who were part of the creation of this policy in 2014, Secretary Blinken, uh, Brett McGurk, these are all folks who are uh, now serving the United States once more. President Biden about 10 days ago talked about keeping uh, the pressure on ISIS. And I think to me that the key questions are, one is, how do we view this? Do we view this about U.S. national security and keeping the pressure on the Islamic State? Because two facts are deeply salient here. One is that it is much easier to kill a terrorist than to slay an ideology. And while the physical caliphate of the Islamic State ended, there's no one who uh, has worked on this problem set every day, every day uh, out who would say at all that ISIS has ended. In fact, if you look in places in parts of Northern Iraq and in, in Derzor and others, there is definitely uh, a real concern on the ground about uh, an ISIS uh, reemergence into whatever next iteration it will be without the physical terrain of the caliphate. And the second thing is that every Gold Star family is a tragedy. As, as Beverly, I know we talked about during Ashley's war, but if you think that to get rid of the, of the Islamic State's territorial hold, um, the United States had fewer than 10 combat deaths in Syria. And this partner of course, as Zima and Roja, Roja and Roja and their teammates lost 10,000 people. That I think there is this sense that there was sacrifice and they continue to hold thousands of ISIS fighters that their own countries do not want to take back. So the question is, I think, how does this type policy tightrope play out in the third administration? What is weighed as being prioritized by the Obama, I'm sorry, by the Biden administration? And can diplomacy make a real difference here? Can the U.S. really exercise diplomatic muscle to find common ground, which I don't think is out of the question because all of these sides were negotiating as recently as 2015. Mm -hmm. We have another question uh, from the audience, uh, Banu Yanar, a student from the anthropology department at, I hope I say this right, Yeditepe University is asking if there's any reaction from the men of the YPG, that's the men's group, against the women of the YPJ. Did they accept the idea of women fighting beside them right away? Uh, was it something that happened over time that they accepted? Uh, what a great question. And so Nehru's, if you see in the book, Nehru's really talked about the beginning, people were like, you know, come on, look, you already have, these are folks, and, and the book talks about this throughout, right, that Abdullah Ocalan's principle is also guided by Murray Bookchin, who was a Jewish former communist turned anarchist turned really grassroots New England style town uh, hall democracy kind of exhorter and, and real advocate and author whose ideas were well ahead of his time, talking about green environmental consciousness, uh, concern about corporate power. You know, his ideas plus Ocalan's ideas get placed, get mixed and combined, and they come into place in Northeastern Syria in this governance structure that then gets catapulted onto the global stage by the United States. 
So the men uh, of the People's Protection Units at the beginning are like, okay, a couple of women, that's fine, right? Then in 2013, women decide to form the Women's Protection Units. And there's a moment in the book with, you know, Nehru says at the beginning, they were all kind of looking at us like, come on, you don't need this. Do you really? And they just walked them through why they thought it was important. And when I said to Rojda, you know, so, so why did you do it? And she said, well, you know, first of all, we couldn't let extremism stand, right? We couldn't let a world in which women were bought and sold in which extremism flourished stand. And secondly, we just didn't want men taking credit for our work. And when she said that, I thought, you know, there's no one, I don't care where you are in the world. There is no woman who won't get that. So I think that the men didn't love it, but they also, I think going back to your question about who they were, they weren't trying to bring along everybody. There were enough men who also read Ojalan and saw the Kurds cannot be free until women are free, who read his writings on the topic, who were convinced enough. And then I think the battlefield is such a leveler. And I found this in Ashley's War too. You know, uh, there's a, a, a moment where one of the, the men was talking to me about, you know, the first person who saved his life on the battlefield was a woman who grabbed him and, and dragged him off and got him away from a firefight that had turned very bloody. And I think that is what convinced people. And then the whole, you know, if you can see it, you can be it of, of dads watching on television, the fight for Kobani and watching young women defend this town and then feeling, well, maybe it's not so bad if my daughter goes and does this because it's for our community. Mm -hmm. Have the women read your book? <laughs> you mentioned earlier that they, they yeah. kept asking as you kept coming back and asking <laughs> more questions, is the book ever going to be published? Well, it's been published. Have they read it? Have they, have they talked to you about what they think about it? Yes. And, and they've been so moved, honestly, by all of you, uh, by seeing that people take it personally, by seeing that people, you know, I think, see themselves in the humanity and the kind of ordinariness and also the extraordinariness of the backdrop. Um, I think we all have sisters and friends who don't take no for an answer, right? So a lot of people wrote to me about Azima. Oh, she reminds me just of my sister who, who's always doing something headstrong. Or, you know, Znareen, who, who saw so much of her early young, early adulthood be filled with boarded dreams. And I think you know, my mother-in-law even talked to me about, look, when I was growing up, you could be a secretary, a nurse, or a teacher. That was it. Your parents chose who you married. You know, it, it, so it's so interesting. And I think they're very moved to see uh, people here really take that personally. And, and honestly, that's what means the most to me. It also will be published uh, locally in Kamish. Uh -huh. And and in the in the language of the region, right? Yeah. In Kurdish and in Arabic both. Um, as we get uh, approach the top of the hour here, I, I wanna uh, circle back uh, with a question uh, um, uh, about the importance of these stories being told so that future generations read about this and maybe look at armed conflict in a way differently from what we see it now. Um, what are your thoughts uh, uh, about making sure that this story is recorded and is available, not only to the Western world, but to the folks in the region in their languages that where they can read these stories for themselves. It is so important, right? I mean, what a privilege for me to be able to share this story. But the, the minute that a publisher said that we'd like to publish this locally, I was like, this is the best news we'd had. This was several weeks before the book came out. Um, there's a moment at the end of the book where I asked Nehru's, this was in December, 2019. And I said, did you ever think about a, a world that looked different for you where you had children or, you know, when, when, your, when your life looked different? She had grown up the daughter of a mother who never got to go to school. And her mother actually reminded me so much of mine because she would always say, make sure your life looks different from mine. And my mother actually used to say something very similar. And, and it really did matter. I think about it all the time. And she'd say, you know, her mom never got to go to school. She, she got educated, she's literate. She got to lead the women's protection forces. And she said, look, I love children, but what we do is for my nieces and nephews, right? So they'll be able to publish in their language, but they're gonna go to school in their language. And also so that they'll know that we did this for them. Mm -hmm. And I hope that a girl from any community in 20 years, 30 years knows that we did this for them. So what's next for you? Oh. <laughs> Oh, Beverly, what a question. Um, I would say, first of all, and when people trust you with a story like this, you go to bed with this responsibility and you wake up with this responsibility. So I enlist all of you to share it with, with your moms and your 
dads and your cousins and your neighbors to really um, sh just to share this story because I think there's so much about community and about friendship and about love and about the what Admiral McRaven called you know the the horror war and the nobility of, of testing yourself and um, so that's the first thing is to really do justice to the story and, and its complexity. Um, then let's see, you know, I had been working as I talk about in the prologue of the book about a book on, um, that really centered on the women who raised me uh, on this generation of single moms who were the first people to have ATMs and call waiting and, uh, you know, all kinds of technological advances that were for people who were working all the time. And, you know, my mom worked at the phone company during the day and sold Tupperware at night to give me uh, every opportunity possible and, and to kind of take people into the humor and the heart and also the kind of economic cliff that you're always just about to topple over uh, when you live in that world. So, so we'll see. But in the meantime, I really am focused on getting the Daughters of Kobani into the hands of all of you. Well, the book, The Daughters of Kobani is just incredible. This is my marked up copy that I wrote <laughs> in pre preparation for this uh, session today. And I have to say, and really I'm quoting back to you, uh, this might be the only book where on the book jacket with the quote, you have a quote from Admiral McRaven and a quote from Elizabeth Gilbert and a quote from Angelina Jolie. So I, there's something to be said for that, I think. Three different people from three very different walks of life, uh, all talking about uh, the stories that are in this book and how it's something that should be uh, on your reading list. Uh, uh, and uh, Gail, I just want to thank you so much for agreeing to do this. We've been talking about this. You were still writing the book last summer when I said, oh, well, you have to do Smart Women, Smart Power with me. Um, and I'm so grateful that you said yes. So thank you. Thank you for being with us here today. Thank you so much. And, and I really uh, love the work you're doing. I'm so excited for you to share the story of, of women who can remove the limits that we often see governing our lives. And I hope uh, all of you have an amazing International Women's Day. And yes, thanks to every one of you for watching today. And we don't have the exact date for our next Smart Women, Smart Power event, but we do have a confirmed guest that I'm very excited about. And we're still working with her on, uh, on the date, but we will be hosting the Foreign Minister of Panama, Erica Munoz, uh, for a future date for Smart Women, Smart Power a little bit later this spring or summer, working with her with her team. But she wanted us to announce that she has confirmed that she will participate and we are delighted that she will be. And uh, happy International Women's Day to all of you watching and thank you so much for joining us today.